Well, good evening. <laughs> it's wonderful to see you all here. We've been greatly anticipating this evening. My name is Matt Goff. I'm the, the pastor here at First Presbyterian Church uh, since last August, and I have been looking forward to this since I have arrived, as um, we are a, a church that really has always appreciated um, a faith that can, can grow. <laughs> and a faith that can utilize the mind and the intellect and reason and be a place uh, where people um, continue to be encouraged to grow and learn. I uh, just want, if you do not have a faith community that you would like to celebrate this uh, uh, and, and observe this week of the Passion, I just quickly will invite you to, this is the one plug, I promise, <laughs> to uh, our Monday Thursday service tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock right here. We also have a Tenebrae service on Good Friday at 7 o'clock here, and then two Easter services on Easter at 9 or 11, with a breakfast in between at 10 o'clock. And I know this doesn't have a lot to do with faith, but we have a 10.30 Easter egg hunt in Central Park for the kids. <laughs> and so if you do not have a faith community already, we invite you to any of those services or all of them. Uh, I'm going to invite Winston McCullough up to introduce our speaker, Marcus Borg. Winston has, uh, is a professor of psychology at uh, Oregon State University, and he's also a great jazz musician who plays here just about every Sunday. So welcome, Winston. <laughs> So thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's great to see such a big crowd to welcome Dr. Marcus Borg. Um, I'd just like to quickly introduce him to you. Dr. Marcus Borg is presently canon theologian at Trinity Episcopal Cathedral up in Portland. He's internationally known as a biblical and Jesus scholar, both in academic and church circles around the world. He was formerly Hunder Chair of philosophy and cult sorry, religion and culture in the philosophy department at OSU, where he taught for almost 30 years um, and retired in 2007. He's the author of 20 amazing books. They include The Last Week, uh, co-authored by John Dominic Crossan, which I believe we might be hearing a bit about tonight. Uh, his books also include Reading the Bible Again for the First Time and The Heart of Christianity, uh, which are both bestsellers. And if you prefer fiction, his book Putting Away Childish Things is a wonderful novel, highly recommended. Um, grassroots booksellers are offering Dr. Borg's books out, out in the lobby in the 8th Street entrance, and I believe uh, Dr. Borg will be available to sign a book and to briefly greet you if you'd like to do that right after his lecture tonight. Um, Marcus has also appeared on NBC's Today Show uh, and Dateline, PBS's NewsHour, ABC's Evening News and Primetime with Peter Jennings, and NPR's Fresh Air with Terry Gross. I was looking forward to doing that all, t all day today. Um, his credentials um, go on and on, and, and those of us who, who know about Marcus Borg um, as, a, as a former participant here at First Presbyterian Church um, know the impact that he's made in the world, and, and those credentials are, are what I need to say to introduce him. What I really want to say um, from my heart is uh, to, just to thank him, basically, um, and to express gratitude um, because of the hard work that he's done for so many decades to open up the scriptures, um, open up new perspectives, help us to connect with God and Jesus and the scriptures and the spiritual life um, in a way that's, that is vibrant and alive today for so many of us here, here at First Presbyterian Church in Oregon, in the United States, and around the world where his books have been translated into so many languages. He's a, he's a rare person who has a very long reach. He's connected with so many people, and um, not just with uh, an intellectual understanding of religious things, but also with a path of the heart um, that's been so valuable to so many of us. So it's, it's really impossible to express our gratitude properly, but we wish to do that. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Marcus Borg. Thank you. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Does this come up any higher? <laughs> this limits the range of pastors here to a certain height range, okay? If you're any taller than I am, and I'm not very tall, you would not be able to see your notes. Okay, well, that is not exactly how I plan to start tonight. Um, and I want to... Thank Winston in particular for that introduction and for the, the warmth of the ending of it. The first part of it I told him to say, but the rest he made up, okay? And I also want to acknowledge, and I thought of this today as Marianne and I were driving over the mountains. We now live in rural central Oregon, for those of you who know that part of the state halfway between Redmond and Prineville, and that's pretty remote. And as we were driving in today, I was realizing and also saying to her how much of my history is tied up with Corvallis and with this church. Um, Winston mentioned that I taught at OSU for 28 years, I arrived here in 1979, and in retrospect, I was a kid, no, I was, but I was a young man, you know, and now I'm an old man and I'm still here. But anyway, um, uh, so much of my history tied up with this community and with this church. I think it was in 1981 that uh, Gene Picorni, whose name some of you will recall, invited me to teach an adult education class here in the spring of that year. And that began my relationship with First Presbyterian. And uh, this is the church also in which Mary Ann and I were married in 1985. And John and Nancy Dennis have been important people in our lives ever since. And all of that is a reason or are among the reasons why it's so nice to be back here uh, this evening and to be with you again. I want to start off by asking you as a group of people a few questions. Raise your hand when appropriate. Um, how many of you regard First Presbyterian as your church home? Ha! Huh. About 20%. Where are the rest of your people? <laughs> no, that's just fine. That's just fine. Um, let me go for some other um, religious identities. I'm not going to try to cover them all. How many of you are Episcopalians? And I can put up a hand for that. There might be 15 or 18 of us here. Do we have any Lutherans with us? Half a hand for Lutherans. I grew up Lutheran. Uh, okay, there's maybe a dozen here. Roman Catholic? Praise the Lord, they're to my left. <laughs> uh, maybe half a dozen or so. Uh, Methodists? Okay, I would guess around 20 to 25. Uh, Disciples of Christ, the Christian Church. Okay, I think three or four of you. And uh, let's see. Baptists, any Baptists with us? No. <laughs> okay, okay, is there, okay. Um, former Baptists, do we have any? <laughs> Former Baptist with well, us? Okay, we've got a few, we've got a few, that's good. And um, uh, people from religious traditions other than Christianity? And uh, I think about four of you. And let's see, um, Church Alumni Association, people who grew up in the church, 
left and aren't sure you're back. Do we have any church alumni with us? Okay, they're usually around. Can't quite cut the tie, half a dozen. And uh, we'll be taking your names. You're eligible for the alumni fund. <clears throat> and that's probably enough of uh, role taking. If I've left somebody out, and I almost certainly have, I apologize. Our topic tonight, <clears throat> the passion of Jesus, and I'll explain the topic in a moment, is of course fairly serious. And so I thought it would be okay to begin with something relatively light. So I want to take a few minutes to share with you a series of church bloopers. And the danger in doing this is that these are on the internet, so you may already have run into them. Uh, but these are sentences that actually appeared in church bulletins or were announced at church services. See? Church bloopers. First one. The fasting and prayer conference includes meals. <clears throat> the sermon this morning, Jesus walks on the water. This evening's sermon, searching for Jesus. <clears throat> Next one. Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. <laughs> the next one. Don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. <laughs> Miss Charlene Mason sang I will not pass this way again, giving obvious pleasure to the congregation. <laughs> <clears throat> For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. I think that's about guys, but I'm not sure. Okay. Irving Benson and Jesse Carter were married on October 24th in the church. So ends a friendship that began in their school days. <laughs> Only a few more. At the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, What is Hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> The church will host an evening of fine dining, super entertainment, and gracious hostility. <laughs> the ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind. <laughs> you can kind of see this one coming. They may be seen in the basement on Friday <laughs> afternoon. The eighth graders will be presenting Shakespeare's Hamlet in the church basement Friday at 7. The congregation is invited to attend this tragedy. <laughs> Weight Watchers will meet at 7 o'clock in the First Presbyterian Church. Please use large double doors at the side <laughs> entrance. And finally, Low Self-Esteem Support Group will meet Thursday at 7 o'clock. Please use the back door. <clears throat> okay. Two other very preliminary and brief comments. Uh, first of all, I have prepared a handout for tonight's talk. Uh, if you didn't get one, you can probably put up a hand and somebody will bring one to you. And I prepare handouts for two reasons. One is very obvious, to make it as easy as possible for you to follow what I'm saying. And then when I'm done, 
<coughs> to see it whole. And the second reason is that I like to make what I have to say as portable as possible. So if there's anything in what I have to say tonight that's useful in your own educational setting, I encourage you to borrow shamelessly. And then finally, comment about format. I think what I have to say will take about 50 minutes, which means I should be done at 8 or a few minutes after. And then we'll have until 8.30 for some Q&A. And uh, that will bring the formal part of the evening to a close. And I make the transition now to my talk with a brief prayer from St. Augustine from around the year 400. So we go back in time some 16 centuries <clears throat> to this prayer from a bishop in North Africa. O God, from whom to be turned is to fall, to whom to be turned is to rise, and in whom to stand is to abide forever. Grant us in all our duties your help, in all our perplexities your guidance, in all our dangers your protection, and in all our sorrows your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> so, let me begin with two brief statements that actually aren't on the handout. I wish every Christian knew the events of Holy Week. If we did, it would change our understanding of what Christianity is about. But most Christians don't, and I don't mean that to be a condescending remark about Christians, but it simply reflects the pattern of church going for most people. We're typically in church primarily on Sundays. And so we go from Palm Sunday <coughs> to Easter, without much awareness of what happened in between, except, of course, we all know that on Good Friday, um, Jesus was crucified. But that's the extent of what most people know about Holy Week. The second preliminary remark is this. Suppose that Jesus did not die to pay for our sins. Suppose that understanding is simply wrong for both historical and theological reasons, and I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Well, what then is Good Friday about? Indeed, what then is Christianity about if it's not about Jesus dying for our sins so that we can be forgiven. If we see that differently, it's obvious that it would change what we think Christianity is about. So I turn now to the handout and a very brief prologue. Namely, the overall title of my talk, of course, is the passion of Jesus. And I want to acknowledge at the outset two meanings of the phrase, the passion of Jesus. One meaning is what he was passionate about, as when we might ask of somebody, what's your passion in life? And the answer to that question is relatively clear. What Jesus was passionate about was God and God's passion. God was the central reality of his life. I think of him as a Jewish mystic, 
and for a mystic, God is the central reality. Think also of his response to the question, what is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And God's passion, which we see in Jesus, was the kingdom of God, which is about the transformation of this world, now, I've written a lot about this and talked about this, including in this space, so I'm not going to say a lot right now, except to remind you of what's most important. The kingdom of God was the heart of Jesus' message. So the Gospel of Mark presents it. The opening words of Jesus in the first Gospel to be written are about the coming of the kingdom of God. It's Mark's way of summarizing in advance what this story is about, what this figure is about, what the gospel is about. And very importantly, the kingdom of God is not about heaven. You know, the notion that Christianity matters because there is a heaven and a hell is a profound distortion of the biblical understanding of things. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm not denying that there's an afterlife. To use an old southern expression, I don't have a dog in that fight. I don't know. And I, to be truthful, really don't care. But in any case, it's not just about what I think. It's that the kingdom of God is not about how do you get to heaven. And this shouldn't surprise any Christian. It's right there in the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come on earth as it already is in heaven. I oftentimes at this point, and I will do so again tonight, quote my friend and colleague, John Dominic Crossan, who has the great one-liner about this. Heaven's in great shape. Earth is where the problems are. <laughs> and the coming of the kingdom of God is about the transformation of this world, the humanly created world, from a world of injustice and violence, into a world of justice and peace. That was the passion of Jesus, just as in the great prophets of the Old Testament, and for that matter in the Torah, the law, it is the passion of the God of the Bible. So that's the first and broad meaning of the phrase, the passion of Jesus. The second and narrower meaning refers in particular to his suffering and death. And here I simply want to no note that it was precisely his passion for God and God's kingdom that led to his passion in the narrower sense of the word. So now let me turn to the events of Holy Week. <clears throat> and I'm going to do them day by day. <laughs> but I also have to do them concisely because of limitations of time. Sunday, what is commonly called Palm Sunday. Shorthand advanced summary, the anti-imperial entry into Jerusalem. To provide a context, by the way, the first rule of biblical interpretation in three words, Context, 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 okay? The context is that during the time when Roman governors ruled Judea, every year for the week of Passover, <clears throat> a Roman imperial procession would enter Jerusalem from the west. And that imperial procession would be made up of cavalry and foot soldiers, 
reinforcements for the Roman garrison permanently stationed in Jerusalem itself because Passover was politically the most volatile time of the year. And you can see why. It remembered and celebrated ancient Israel's liberation from a previous imperial power, namely ancient Egypt. And now, once again, the Jewish people were under another imperial power. Jesus enters the city either the same day, could have been a day difference, from the east at the head of another procession. And it's real clear that what Jesus did was planned in advance. He's made the arrangements in advance according to Mark's gospel. It's very deliberate, very intentional. And entering the city on a donkey echoes a passage from the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah 9.9, which speaks of a king of peace who will enter the city and banish the weapons of war from the land, banish the battle bow and the war horse, and speak peace to the nations. Now, Jesus and his followers would have known about that Roman practice. And thus, his entering the city on what we call Palm Sunday is a pre-planned political demonstration, of course it's religious as well, that basically sets up the conflict that will dominate the rest of the week. And before the week is over, will lead, of course, to Jesus' execution by the authorities. Monday, what we commonly call the purification of the temple happens. Jesus overturns the tables of some of the money changers in the temple courtyard. It's unfortunate that it's called the purification of the temple. Unfortunate in part because it's not called that in the Gospels. It's a phrase we've added. And unfortunate because it suggests that Jesus' concern perhaps was that business and worship shouldn't be mixed together. That's certainly the impression that formed in my mind as a child. Whenever I heard that story, I imagined, <clears throat> you know, some merchants set up in the narthex of the church. Didn't they know that that was wrong? And of course, Jesus would be upset by that, mixing commerce with the worship of God. It has nothing to do with that. Instead, the key to understanding what he did <clears throat> is the passage from the book of Jeremiah that he quotes as he does so. It's Jeremiah 7.11. And it indicts the authorities of the temple as having turned the temple into a den of robbers. It can also be translated a cave of robbers, no difference in meaning. And the reason for calling the temple a den of robbers is because the temple had become the center of the native domination system. The authorities in charge of the temple were appointed by the Roman governor, and among their responsibilities was the collection of the Roman tribute tax. And so the temple had become the center of an oppressive and exploitative domination system that exploited 90% or more of the Jewish population in the Jewish homeland. The reaction of the authorities to what Jesus did on Monday is that they decide he must be killed. But they don't dare to take action because they know that much of the crowd, and for Passover, 
there might have been an extra 200,000 or so Jewish pilgrims in the city, a city of 40,000 people would swell during the season of Passover to a quarter of a million. And many of the pilgrims were sympathetic to Jesus. And so we are told the authorities did not dare take action because they were afraid the crowd would riot in defense of Jesus. That's Monday. Tuesday is filled with verbal debates between Jesus and the representatives of the authorities. And we are told that their purpose is to trap him in these verbal debates into saying something that will discredit him with the crowd so that the authorities can then arrest him without the crowd providing a protective screen. Probably the most famous or best known of these verbal debates are a question about, uh, well, a question about addressed to Jesus. By what authority are you doing these things? And Jesus says, I'll tell you what, you've asked me a question, I'll make a deal with you. I'm going to ask you a question, you answer my question, I'll answer your question. Now, stupidly, they agree. And he says, so tell me, the baptism of John the baptizer, was that from God or was that a human thing? And the representatives of the authorities confer with each other and they say, okay, now, let's see. If we say it was just a human thing, the crowd won't like that because many of them like John. But if we say it came from God, then he'll say, then why didn't you listen to him? So they say, we don't know. <laughs> and then he says, all right. You haven't answered my question, I'm not going to answer your question. The other best known one would be the render unto Caesar passage. It's so unfortunate that over the centuries that's been treated as if it's doctrinal teaching about the relationship between religion and politics or between church and state as if Jesus is performing, not performing, pronouncing in a formal way that yes, there are two spheres, the religious sphere and the political sphere. In the political sphere, obey your government. In the religious sphere, obey God. It wasn't that at all. The whole point of that exchange is that his opponents are trying to trap him into saying either it's okay to pay taxes to Caesar, which would discredit Jesus with much of the crowd who resented Roman control and rule and taxation, or he could say, no, it's not legal to pay taxes to Caesar, in which, he came, in which case he would have committed in public a reasonable and executionable offense. So it's in that context that Jesus says, do you have a coin? And they produce one, and it's a silver denarius, which is the smallest Roman coin, and it has an inscription, an image of Caesar on it. Right away, the opponents have discredited themselves. They're carrying a graven image with them, which is against Jewish law, and they're carrying a graven image in the court of the temple, the most sacred site within Judaism. And so Jesus says, oh, whose image and inscription is this? And of course they have to say Caesar's. He's evaded their trap. And then he says, it's Caesar's coin, give it back to him. That's what render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's means. 
And is that a formal pronouncement about two realms of authority? Not at all. It's a skillful evasion of a trap. And if you had asked Jesus, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, well, what belongs to Caesar? The answer would have been, not a damn thing. Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Well, there are other exchanges on Tuesday with the authorities continuing to try to ensnare him in his talk. They fail. Wednesday, a short day in terms of description. A woman who is not named, but a follower of Jesus, anoints him for burial. She gets it. She sees where this is leading. And apparently his other followers maybe don't yet get it. And the other thing that happens on Wednesday, a betrayer, Judas, goes to the authorities and tells the authorities where they can find Jesus at night away from the protective screen of the crowd. And then Thursday, Jesus' final meal with his followers and his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. By the way, one of my pet peeves is the way we observe Monday, Thursday in churches. Sorry if you've got your plans made already, but, you know, <laughs> ignorance is an excuse. Okay. Um, you know, we switch from the high drama of how Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the story to John's Gospel, to John 13, and the twofold focus of Monday Thursday, as it's commonly observed, is on the one hand, Jesus' mandate, hence Monday Thursday, Jesus' mandate to love one another. Yeah, that's important, but how vapid. We can talk about loving one another any Sunday of the year. And then the other thing that's done on Monday Thursday is foot washing which can be a very powerful ceremony, especially if you do it like the contemporary pope does it, where you're not just washing the foot of a cardinal with beautifully manicured toenails, but of a prisoner or a deformed person. So it can be powerful, but suddenly, we go to this very individualized scene teaching us to love one another and to be humble and to be servants of each other. Important. But if you haven't been in church since Sunday, and then you go to Monday, Thursday, you kind of get the impression that Jesus got killed because he told people to love one another. It's terrible. End of pet peeve? Okay. Back to what does happen on Thursday. Uh, what we call the Last Supper. Don't think of it, though, as the first communion meal, as if it's somehow already being ritualized. Instead, it continues one of the most visible public features of the activity of Jesus, eating with marginalized and outcast people. They're called tax collectors and sinners in the Gospels. One of his most provocative acts during his public activity, his meal practice. Consider also that what becomes the central Christian sacrament is about food. Real food for real people. You know, our central sacrament could have been about something else. Could have been about light. Could even have been about water. And of course we do use water in baptism, but we do that only once. Our repeated sacrament 
is food. And then add to that the language of body and blood. That language points to a violent death. You get separation of body and blood only in the case of a violent death, and thus it points to the cross. This is all very dramatic compared to love one another and wash each other's feet. Now, Friday, <clears throat> the death of Jesus. A negative prologue. The death of Jesus is not about what is commonly called substitutionary sacrifice, <clears throat> not about substitutionary atonement, even though what I call common Christianity, namely what a majority of Christians take for granted and probably absorbed and learned growing up, has most often thought so. Many of us um, grew up with the message that Jesus paid for our sins by dying in our place, and thus the language of substitute, so that we can be forgiven. And this understanding is reinforced by the majority of common liturgies. Now, there's some variation in mainline Protestant churches. Some more liberal or progressive churches may not include a confession of sin every Sunday morning, but most do, implying that that's the central issue in our life with God. And then think of <clears throat> the use of the Kyrie, Lord, have mercy on us, Christ, have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy on us. When do you plea for mercy? When you know you've done something wrong and deserve to be punished. All of this feeds the notion, once again, that the major issue in our life with God is our sinfulness, and that the death of Jesus has something to do with taking away our sins or providing the basis for us to be forgiven. Now, I call this in shorthand the payment understanding. And I wish every Christian knew that the payment understanding is not found in the first thousand years of Christianity. Or if it is, it is at most a minor metaphor. But many scholars argue that it's not there in the New Testament at all and I'm strongly inclined to agree with them. It was first systematically articulated by a Christian monk, priest, abbot, and eventual archbishop named Anselm around the year 1100, 1098, if you're anal retentive about such things. And so it's less than a thousand years old. Anselm used a cultural model drawn from his setting in the Middle Ages. Namely, he used the cultural model of the relationship between a medieval lord, don't think God now, but a large landowner, okay? The relationship between a medieval lord and his serfs, or peasants, or subjects. And Anselm uh, asks us to imagine that a serf, a subject, has disobeyed the Lord, and that it has come to the Lord's attention. And Anselm asks, can the Lord simply forgive the subject if he feels like it? And his answer is no, because that would imply that disobeying the Lord doesn't matter very much. And word might get out to the other serfs that this guy's a softy. And 
It might create a state of anarchy if serfs and peasants thought they could disobey the Lord without consequence. And so Anselm argues, payment must be made in order to preserve the Lord's honor and order. And then he applied this cultural model to our relationship with God. That God cannot simply forgive human sin without satisfaction being made, or, would it, or it would imply that sin doesn't matter that much to God. And then Anselm does this. He said, but, you know, the most sin that I could pay for would be my own sins. The only way I or any human being could pay for other people's sins would be if they were sinless themselves, and thus their death could acquire a surplus of merit. And and some says, and that's why Jesus had to come. We needed a perfect human being, but you couldn't be a perfect human being unless you were also God, hence the necessity of the incarnation of the God-man. Now, some comments about that. <clears throat> First of all, you hear this argument to this day. Uh, I've heard it a lot in conservative Christian preaching and especially writing. With no awareness <clears throat> that this is a relatively recent innovation. Now, 900 years ago may not seem recent to you, but again, it's not there in the first thousand years of Christianity. This is its chief historical problem. It also has serious theological problems. It basically implies that the death of Jesus had to happen, that it was part of God's plan of salvation, necessitated by the sins of our primordial ancestors as well as by our own sins. And this is the plan God came up with in order to make our forgiveness possible. The death of Jesus was really the will of God? Really? What does that say about God? And a related problem. It also suggests that God is a God of wrath who demands that the price of sin be paid or else. I don't know of any human parent that is that demanding. You know? I mean, the worst that most of us will do with our kids is to ground them for a week or something like that. But demanding that a blood payment be made? Why has this not struck hundreds of millions of Christians as completely wrong? Okay, I'll back away now a little bit, okay? <laughs> and finally, there is no precedent no foundation for this in the Bible. In the Bible, including the Old Testament and the religion of Judaism, though sacrifice is very much there, and it's a good word, it is never about payment for sin. You know, it's like, if you do needlepoint, write that out. Sacrifice in the Bible is never about payment for sin. If you do glass blowing, turn it into a neon sign. Okay? <clears throat> Let me briefly comment about the purposes of sacrifice in the Bible, animal sacrifice in particular. Most generally, sacrifice was about offering a gift to God. And most often, it also involved a meal. 
uh, part of the animal would be completely burned up and would go up to God in smoke. The rest of the animal, in effect, would be cooked. And the community offering the sacrifice would then eat the animal. And what it is, ritually and symbolically, it is a meal with God. God gets part of it, the community eats part of it. And these sacrifices had several different purposes. I'll try to be relatively concise here. There were sacrifices of thanksgiving. Here, you or the community was grateful to God for something. And so, you offer up a sacrifice of thanksgiving. There were sacrifices of petition. Here the community might be facing serious trouble, uh, drought, plague, uh, perhaps an invasion. Have I lost anything here? <laughs> Maybe I can just think, can I ignore this? Okay, all right. I no longer felt like the voice of God, so I thought something's gone wrong here. All right. Um, sacrifices of petition. Community faces, I just mentioned, a drought, plague, invasion by a foreign army. You petition God for a rescue, and you could understand a sacrifice in these circumstances as trying to get God's attention, or even as a bribe, maybe, but it's not about payment. A third purpose is purification. Simplest way to explain this is to note that a woman becomes impure for 40 days after giving birth. Now, it's not that giving birth is wrong or anything. It just makes you impure for 40 days. And the way the impurity is removed at the end of 40 days is by offering up a sacrifice. But again, it's not about payment or wrongdoing or anything. And then finally, there are sacri or, sorry, sacrifices of reconciliation. Uh, these are probably the closest to making a connection between sacrifice and sin. Here the community is aware of having violated the covenant or disobeying God, whatever. And so to repair the relationship, you offer up a gift to God and share a meal with God. But it's still not about payment. It's not as if God really would rather take it out on the people, but he's willing to take it out on the goat. In, in fact, sacrifice of reconciliation has at least a faint analogy parallel in what we do to this day. Suppose you forget your beloved's birthday. What do you do the next day? Send them flowers and take them out for dinner, gift and meal as a way of repairing a broken relationship. Again, it's not about payment, even though it's about reconciliation. The point being, there's no biblical foundation for understanding the death of Jesus as payment for sin. So I turn now to what did happen historically. And I can move more quickly now, since this is more familiar material to you. Jesus didn't just die, he was killed, he was executed, and it's a remarkable fact that every Christian should take seriously. Christianity is the only major religion 
whose central figure was executed by established authority. Ought to make us think about that. And of course, the second most important figure, Paul, was executed by established authority. The third most important figure, Peter, was executed by established authority. If you think James was the fourth most important figure, he was executed by established authority too. How did we become so conventional? And he was executed by the powers that ruled his world, namely by Roman imperial authority in collaboration with high priestly temple authority. Why did they kill him? By now the answer should be obvious. Because he was a radical critic of the nomination system of the wealthy and the powerful. And he was beginning to attract a following. He was killed because of his passion for the kingdom of God. I note also that crucifixion was a very public, painful, and prolonged form of execution. Done in a public place, oftentimes at a crossroads, so that hundreds and perhaps thousands of people just going about their daily business would pass by the execution site and see one or more of these people hung up. <clears throat> it sent a clear warning. This is what Rome does to those who challenge imperial authority. It's like state-sponsored terrorism, if you will. And uh, this gives, it should be obvious, a political meaning to Good Friday. Now, Good Friday has a more than political meaning, but not less. One of the terrible things about the payment understanding is it completely strips Good Friday of any this worldly or political meaning because it implies it had to happen. And that whether the authorities knew it or not, they were really doing God's will. What a betrayal of the passion of Jesus. So, a few words about his death as sacrifice. I want to redeem the word sacrifice to strip it of its payment meaning, which is kind of the default position in the minds of many Christians. You know, we hear the language of sacrifice in a church service and we almost automatically uh, understand that to mean, oh yeah, that's about Jesus dying to pay for our sins. So let me, for three, four minutes, redeem the meaning of the word sacrifice. Recall the ancient meaning of sacrifice that I mentioned a few moments ago. To make something sacred by offering it up to God, that's its etymology, its root in Latin, sacrum facere, to make sacred. Did Jesus offer his life up to God? In a sense, yes but not because it was required and not as a payment, but rather like many martyrs over the centuries, he made of his life a gift to God. One might also think of the word sacrifice with its meaning as dying for others, not instead of others as a substitute, but because of love for others. Briefly to illustrate with the three best known Christian martyrs of the 20th century, Dietrich Bonhoeffer sacrificed his life because of his love for 
was on top of it. it. Okay, there we go. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, killed in the last months of the Third Reich <clears throat> for his involvement in the plot to assassinate Hitler, sacrificed his life because of his love for his own people and even more so because of his love for those whom his own people were victimizing. Martin Luther King sacrificed his life, made of his life a gift to God because of his love for his people. Uh, maybe even because of his love also for the people who were victimizing his people. And just to make the point with one more example, Archbishop Oscar Romero in El Salvador in 1980, after becoming the champion and voice of the poor of El Salvador, the 90% or so of the population, antagonized the ruling powers, and he was gunned down by an assassin's bullet while he was celebrating mass. Did he give up his life because of his love for the people of El Salvador? Oh, yes. But not, be, not as payment. He didn't die in their place or because God required it. He made of his life a gift to God because of his passion for God. And so one may speak of Jesus doing the same. Finally, a very quick comment about death and resurrection and sacrifice as central New Testament images, metaphors, symbols for transformation. Paul speaks of being crucified with Christ, of his having been crucified with Christ so that the old Paul has died and a new Paul now lives whose life is one with Christ. This is death and resurrection as a metaphor for radical internal spiritual transformation. So also in Romans 6, that's in Galatians 2, where Paul does what I just mentioned. So also in Romans 6, dying and rising is the foundation of Christian identity. And it's also the central meaning of John's phrase, being born again, being born into a life centered in the Spirit of God. And Paul uses the language of sacrifice very powerfully as a metaphor for transformation in Romans 12. Present yourselves as living sacrifices. Make of your lives a gift to God. And he continues, do not be conformed to this world, the world of culture, the world of convention, but be transformed through the renewal of your psyche. Take a breath, five minutes to go. Okay? Okay. Easter, the resurrection of Jesus. I begin by noting that within common Christianity, Easter intrinsically involves physicality. In the minds of most Christians, it does. Even in the minds of those Christians who aren't sure things like this really happen. And when I say physicality, I mean something miraculous happened to the corpse of Jesus so that the tomb really was empty. I think an emphasis upon the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus is a huge distraction that obscures what Easter is about. Instead of focusing on 
an utterly stupendous miracle happening one Sunday morning in the past that has never happened anywhere else before or since, it's much more helpful to ask, what did Easter mean for the followers of Jesus? And here, the New Testament is very clear. Two connected meanings in the New Testament. The first, Jesus continued to be experienced after his death. It's a fact of history that some of Jesus' followers had experiences that seemed overwhelmingly to them to be experiences of Jesus after his death. Some of these were visions. Some may have been non-visionary in nature. And in shorthand, this first meaning, very simply, Jesus lives. He's a figure of the present, not just of the past. And the second meaning, his followers experienced him not just as alive, not just as a ghostly figure from the past, but as divine, as having the qualities of God, as Lord, one with God, raised to God's right hand. This is the gist of Thomas's exclamation when the risen Christ appears to him, not just, my God, Jesus, you're still around, but my Lord and my God. And I suggest in conclusion that we might hear the Easter stories as parables of the resurrection. Now the model for this is the parables of Jesus. I think every Christian recognizes that Jesus made those stories up. I don't know any Christian who insists that there really had to be a good Samaritan who behaved that way, or that story is just a fable. We all get the point that parables are about meaning and as such can be truthful and truth-filled and meaningful. And the beauty about treating the Easter stories as parables is you don't have to decide whether you think the tomb was empty or not. Believe whatever you want about that. Now let's talk about what the story means. To illustrate, and I'll end with this, the story of the empty tomb, which is the first narrative of Easter. Paul's uh, reports of the risen Christ appearing to people, they're earlier than the Gospels. But it's only in the Gospels that we get a story, a narrative. And the earliest is of the empty tomb, Mark 16, with parallels in Matthew and Luke. What does that story mean as parable? You won't find Jesus in the land of the dead. This is basically the message that the angels give to the women who come to the tomb. Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He's not here. You're not going to find him in the land of the dead. Imperial execution and a rich man's tomb couldn't hold him, couldn't stop him. He's still loose out there. He's still around. What began in him hasn't ended. He's still recruiting for the kingdom of God. It's not over. For me, that is manifestly true, completely apart from the question of whether something extraordinary happened to the corpse of Jesus. To imagine that taking Easter seriously is about believing that God did for Jesus what God has never done for anybody else. 
I think, virtually trivializes it. And so, whether we think Jesus died to pay for our sins and rose physically and bodily from the dead, or whether we see his death as an execution by the powers and Easter as his vindication by God, how we see that virtually produces two different religions, both using the same scripture and the same language, but with two extraordinarily different understandings of what this means. Thank you. <clears throat>
part of your responsibility was to feed the deity who lived there. And uh, human sacrifice was also used in a petitionary context. Uh, and let me add one other thing that not directly relevant to your question perhaps, but it underlines how the notion of the death of Jesus as payment for sin is a later Christian innovation and not something that had cultural parallels earlier. Uh, substitutionary atonement or satisfaction understanding of the atonement, what I'm calling the payment understanding, it's not part of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And the reason for that is, when you hear it, fairly obvious. The Western Church and the Eastern Church split in 1054, round numbers, roughly 50 years before Anselm wrote. Anselm was a Western theologian, and his theology had no impact on the Eastern Church because, as I just mentioned, they had already divided. So, in addition to the reasons that I provided in the lecture for uh, payment understanding not being biblical, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, one of the most compelling reasons is that it's not there in Eastern Christianity. And if it were the universal teaching of early Christianity, as many conservative Christians take for granted, and once that filter is in place, by the way, once the payment understanding is operating consciously or unconsciously in your head, you're likely to see it everywhere, even when it's not there. But uh, my basic point is, even though many Christians take it for granted, this is ancient, orthodox, traditional Christianity. It manifestly isn't. So, <laughs> Holy Thursday and Good Friday, do we sit in church and participate and keep saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, or what? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you know the fuller story, you're not going to be harmed by hearing a more vapid version of it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and let me add something that might be of more general use. Perhaps Christianity, more than any other religion, has been kind of preoccupied with getting our beliefs right. And that affects conservative Christians in an obvious way. You've got to believe certain things or you're no longer welcome in the community. But progressive Christians, and I don't mean you in particular, Judy, um, <laughs> though I'm quite sure you're willing to affirm being a progressive, but anyway, but I'm not talking about you in particular. But oftentimes, progressive Christians fall into the same trap. It's like, oh, so I can't think the way I thought I was supposed to think while I was growing up, so now I, I got to get it right, okay? And I think that's a mistake too. I think the primary task of theology, kind of the intellectual side of being Christian, is not to get our beliefs right, but to get rid of the beliefs that get in our way. And then to bring that back to Monday, Thursday, and I don't know, Good Friday too. Um, you know, maybe being Christian is much more about belonging to a community and beloving and only I want to say secondarily, but I want to put it down to third, tertially, 
um, only, only thirdly, about uh, believing. So that gives you some scope for being part of a community that does some things differently than you might like them to do. You know. Uh, though, I must admit, if I went to a Good Friday service and heard about Jesus dying to pay for our sins, you know, I, w I would never go to that church again. It's like, I don't need to belong that badly. You know. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Dr. Borg, um, you mentioned that this, these beautiful and freeing thoughts that you expressed tonight have been an evolution for you, that you started where many of us did. Can you summarize a few changes personally that you've experienced once you became aware of this mm. very freeing way of looking at things? Thank you for asking that question. I have a book coming out one month from today. <laughs> that is about that. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm both serious and joking. Joking because I'm a little bit embarrassed to be doing a commercial here, a uh, public service announcement maybe, but, um, but the title of the book is uh, Convictions, colon, How I Have Learned What Matters Most. And the working framework of the book is the triad of memories, memories of what I absorbed, internalized, growing up, Conversions, meaning big changes, uh, why and how they happen, and then the convictions that flow out of that. Let me add one other thing to that. <clears throat> the idea for the book came from the experience of turning 70 about two years ago. For some of you that will seem relatively young, for others you can't imagine it, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for most of you, you're closing in on it. But anyway. Um, and my birthday happened to be a Sunday in Lent. And Trinity in Portland, which was then our home church, invited me to preach. And out of that experience of, uh, you know, 70 is a kind of memento mori, a reminder of mortality in the season of Lent as an extended memento mori, reminder of mortality. Uh, it occurred to me that it might be interesting to speak very boldly about my convictions, settled ways of seeing um, whose foundations it's really hard to imagine being shaken. Now, one has to be careful uh, not to confuse, confuse uh, convictions with the opinions of an old fool. Now, 70 is no guarantee of wisdom and so forth. But in any case, what do I feel most strongly about? And in a way, I've been talking about that for decades. But tonight, I probably have said some things more strongly than I have before. And I think, you know, in the academic world, you tend not to do that. And if you come from a, a, a Christian background like I come from, there's also a real apprehension about sounding dogmatic. You know, like, this is the way things are. But, you know, I am willing to say, <laughs> a payment theology of the cross is a huge betrayal of Jesus. You know, nice, simple, straightforward statement. And, you know, everybody's a free agent. You can just say, Borg, you're full of it. <laughs> you know? Anyway, uh, longer response than I imagined. <clears throat> Um, payment on the cross. What about payment on the battlefield for a greater cause? Hmm. What about payment on the battlefield? I'm assuming it's not a question about is war legitimate? No. 
No, it's a different thing. Yeah, and think of how, I mean, I think it's a good example of a common and legitimate use of the word sacrifice. A soldier uh, killed in combat, combat, we regularly speak of him or her sacrificing their life for the sake of their country or for the sake of the cause. And we perhaps especially do that <clears throat> when they're killed because they're trying to save a comrade or whatever. Soldier sacrifices life. And, but we don't for a moment imagine that that's something required by God or that it's a payment for something somebody has done wrong. So sacrifice, yes, but not substitutionary payment or whatever. I'm pretty upset with Anselm. Yeah. <laughs> and since I was a child, I've been really, really bothered by the thing in Easter that I get forgiven. And then I'm thinking that was pretty cheap forgiveness because now I'm just starting to accumulate all over again and I've got to wait to get to be forgiven. And it just didn't make sense and it really, really bothered me. I think that's it's a. I hope that Jesus died for Anselm's sins. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But what, 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 why did he, why did this catch on? Yeah. Yeah, why did it catch on? Um, I have not run into, well, let me say this. By Within 200 years or so of when Anselm wrote, it had become the dominant understanding in Western Christianity. And uh, I, have, I have not researched deeply into what the causes of that might have been. So when I say I haven't found a persuasive compelling explanation of how it became so widespread so fast. It might be because of uh, not spending enough time uh, trying to read what others have read, written about that. Um, you know, this is, this is such a generic answer. There are some ideas that just fit like a glove with a certain set of cultural understandings. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, we understand what the relationship is between a medieval lord and his serfs. And yeah, it makes sense that uh, you can't just go around forgiving a rude or disobedient serf, and yeah, uh, that makes sense of our relationship with God. Another possibility, though this happens in the 1300s, is the Black Death or the Black Plague, which historians estimate killed roughly 25% of the population of Europe, and it led to uh, penitential movements that were convinced that God's wrath was being poured out on the people of Europe. And uh, so you get the flagellantes and so forth, you know, who are going around half naked, whipping themselves, scourging themselves, trying to assuage the wrath of God. Maybe, maybe all of that plays a role in uh, God is a wrathful God whose wrath must be assuaged and so forth. Be a great PhD thesis for somebody. <laughs> Why did it catch on so fast? Okay. Um, I think we're at our agreed upon ending time. I love q and I could do this, oh, I wouldn't say all night, but <laughs> a lot longer. Let me send you off with a benediction that's very familiar to those of you who uh, have been part of this church. 
Marianne and I both learned this benediction from John Dennis. And I've never asked you where you picked it up. I'll find it out at breakfast tomorrow, okay? And uh, it's now showing up all around the country, and maybe that's been true for a long time. I don't know. But it's from the journal of a Swiss poet philosopher named Henri, the French Henry, Amiel, A-M-I-E-L, for December 1868. Life is short. And we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So, be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessings of God, Creator, Christ, and ever-present Spirit be with you this night and evermore. Amen.